The recording has begun. This is um, Dr. John Alan Journey talking about climate change. And Alan, I give it over to you. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed. And thanks to everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am going to be talking about the basics of global warming, and then I'll talk a little about models and so forth towards the end. As we're going through, I'll be introducing a series of, a series of question pauses where folks can, if you've, asked, if you've written a question in the chat, then Carrie will read some of those questions. So my, my goal is to answer the question, why are we warming? Uh, I am a co-facilitator of Southern Oregon Climate Action Now, a organization that's been in operation since 2012, so we're low these eight years old. If you have questions and you'd like to get in touch with me, please uh, shoot me an email at alan at socan.eco. These are the series of questions that I'm going to um, answer as we go through this, uh, this afternoon's presentation. And uh, we'll essentially have a break between each of those questions. So let's start with the first one. What's the difference between climate and weather? You often hear people talking about climate and weather as though they are interchangeable terms, and they really are not. The term weather refers to a different time scale than the term climate. Essentially, the term weather refers to the mix of events that's happening on a given day in our atmosphere, in our personal local atmospheres, it includes temperature, rainfall, humidity, and any kind of severe weather conditions that are happening. And so I've got a couple of images here to illustrate what we understand weather to be. Uh, climate, on the other hand, refers to much longer scale kinds of um, trends. Um, and this is a trend of global temperature from 1900 to 2017, and this is essentially the kind of time scale that we're looking at when we're talking about climate. In fact, the folks in the climate science arena will say if you're not, if you're not looking at a period that's less than about 30 years, you're really not looking at climate because it's long-term trends. So we're looking at the same variables uh, when we're looking at climate as we do when we're looking at weather. So you can see we look at temperature, rainfall, humidity, winds, and so forth. So that was the first little question to get out of, out of the way the difference between climate and weather. So now I'm going to talk about what is causing global warming and uh, the global warming that we are experiencing. And as this uh, program was built, it's uh, basically designed to be climate science for scientists. And so I'm going to try and, uh, and keep it as simple and straightforward as I can. When we're looking at um, uh, scientific issues, and I spent a lot of time teaching the process of science when I was teaching in the biology department in Missouri, um, we talk about competing hypotheses a lot, and it's kind of the essence of science. We, look at, we come up with an array of hypotheses to explain the phenomenon and try and test them and eliminate those that um, are not functional. And just to put that into context, I'll give you an everyday example of what we might, uh, we might do in the context of competing, of competing hypotheses. So here's, here's our TV. So imagine you come home one day and the TV's not working. So the question, what might you do? Well, you could engage in random acts of hope and desperation like polishing the screen. You could pray for divine intervention. You better see, assert the TV's really working and sit and watch a blank screen anyway. You could give up and read a book. Or you could try science. You could generate and test a series of hypotheses to explain why the TV is not working. So one of the hypotheses might be the remote is not switched to TV. The batteries are flat. The TV is not plugged in. The power connection to the TV is broken. The power strip is turned off. The circuit breaker for the TV line is off. And so these would be potentially our competing hypotheses. And so what we're going to do quite reasonably is work our way through these, trying them and 
by the fact that they, one of these actually is the hypothesis that explains why the TV is not working, or as we go through, falsifying them and rejecting them. Only if we falsified every hypothesis that we could come up with would we infer that the TV is broken, which could be the explanation. So that's what we're do doing when we're conducting science. We try to come up with every possible hypothesis we can to explain the phenomenon, and then we work through them, testing them, and trying to falsify them. The idea in science is you try to falsify hypotheses. You don't try to prove that they're correct. And I won't explain that one any further, but please trust me, that's not how science works. So I have here, we're going to start looking at the first uh, hypothesis that the explanation for the warming we're seeing in, relates to um, greenhouse gases and so forth. So I have a, a multiple choice question, and I'm going to just pause for um, about a minute to give you a chance to look through the um, five possible answers to the question. According to current climate science theory, which of the following is the dominant cause for the current warming of our atmosphere? So, about a minute. See what one of those you think is the explanation. What you will uh, appreciate probably is, as we go through this first segment of the class, I'll uh, come back to this question and we'll answer it again. I'm not going to ask you to write your name, write your name down and give your choice on this one, but uh, we'll come back to it again after we've gone through the next little period of discussion. One of the things that I will be doing as I go through these presentations is showing you some graphs. And one of the things that uh, I realize is not everybody is as familiar with graphs as, as I am, having spent 30 years teaching biology. So um, what I'll do is start off with a relatively straightforward graph and spend a minute uh, explaining how to look at a graph. The basic rule of thumb with graphs, this is a graph making rule, is this the vertical axis is the y axis and the horizontal axis is called the x axis. And generally speaking, when people do graphs, they are making the uh, argument that the vertical axis, variations in that vertical axis are a function of or correlated with the horizontal axis. So in this case, what we're doing is looking at the temperature of the vertical axis as it fluctuates over time. It's not argued that time is causing the change in temperature, but the temperature fluctuates as the time goes along. Um, most times you, when you look at a graph, you will find it has a title, and it's always good to look at the title, which will tell you what uh, the graph is trying to show you. What we're looking here at is a global mean temperature um, according to NASA's data. This is uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. So these are the data that they have um, presented on global temperature over the period of 1980 to 2020. What you can see as we look at this graph is it was pretty flat up until around the 1970s, but from the 1970s, 1980s onwards, we've been experiencing a rather steep increase in temperature. In fact, 19 of the 20 hottest years have actually occurred since the year 2000. Uh, the 20th of the hottest years was in fact in 1998, so it wasn't that long ago. Since the 1970s, we've seen uh, a warming of about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. If we go back to the 1880s, that's uh, over 2 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we go back to the 1750s, which is a critical uh, period to go back to, because 1750s, when we think of the industrial revolution as having happened, but the temperature increase since the 1750s is well over 2 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So what we can see is if we look at, uh, put a, a line through um, the data from about the late 1970s, 1980s onward, we can see a trend in increasing temperature, which is following in that pattern. Now, there was a lot of talk about there being a slowdown in warming occurring during the first decade of this century. Um, I'm not going to have time to go into why that really is an artifact, not really, um, because um, all we've seen is since uh, as we um, go on beyond um, 2010, you can see that the the, the time has uh, really come back, and in fact, we're definitely back on that trajectory, if not even exceeding it. So let's uh, explore the current explanation for what's happening. What we're looking at here is a graph which depicts the various wavelengths of light. It's called the spectrum of wavelengths of light. And on the vertical axis, is a measure of the intensity of that incoming um, radiation. So we're looking here at um, a series of wavelengths. And this is where the intensity of those different wavelengths as the radiation reaches the outside of our atmosphere. The um, light color represents the amount of radiation that's absorbed by our atmosphere. And then the colored area represents the intensity of radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth. As we look at this chart, what we can see is the range of radiation that contains the most energy, it's the most intense, is radiation in the visible light range, the range that we used to see. That's the high energy end of the spectrum. If we go down to the other end of the spectrum, we're in infrared heat uh, ranges of wavelengths. And what you can see here is those wavelengths intrinsically have less energy in them than, do, than does do wavelengths in the visible light range. That's a critical point that we'll explore in a bit more detail as we get to the next graph. So you can see this graph again dis displays the spectrum of solar radiation in terms of the different wavelengths measured here in micrometers, a slightly different scale from the previous one. And on the vertical axis again, you can see the intensity. And so this graph is very similar to the one that we just saw. But I'm using this graph to depict a slightly different component of the, uh, the issue here. So up here we have our smiley sun. Sun is always smiling in my world. So what we're seeing is that a hot body, like the sun, emits radiation much to a much greater extent in the short wavelength range. That's the visible light and the ultraviolet light ranges. So largely, as we reach the surface of the Earth, and you can see that depicted here, Wavelengths of radiation in those ranges reach the surface of the Earth, and uh, so they reach the atmosphere, pass through the atmosphere, get to the surface of the Earth, and this green uh, line is supposed to represent the surface of the Earth. And this is a critical component, and it's a component that many folks don't, don't understand. But it becomes very important the more time you spend um, exploring the whole or question of what this is the radiation in the visible range reaches the surface of the earth and then it's transformed into longer wavelength infrared heat radiation and that radiation then passes back out through the atmosphere and dissipates into space and so sort of paradoxically as I mentioned, hot bodies give off light. Cold bodies, like the Earth, actually emit heat, longer wavelength radiation. It seems paradoxical, but that's just the way it is. And that's a critical component to understand the argument. 
incoming visible light, short wavelength radiation um, energy, gets transformed into a longer wavelength heat, which radiates back outwards. Which brings us to this whole idea of the greenhouse effect. Again, we have a sunny, smiling face. Visible radiation passes through the glass, and we know it passes through the glass because we know we can see through glass. That's visible radiation passing through the glass. And just as I described a moment ago, that reaches the surfaces of the benches in the greenhouse or around the greenhouse, and it's transformed into longer wavelength heat radiation, which starts radiating back outwards. Now, one of the curious properties of glass is that it allows short wavelength radiation to pass through, but it doesn't allow longer wavelength radiation, heat, infrared, to pass through anywhere near as effectively. It does pass through slightly, but nowhere near as effectively. And so what happens is that radiation passes through the atmosphere of the greenhouse, hits the glass, and bounces. And it bounces back across the greenhouse, hits the glass the other side, and is trapped inside the greenhouse. And so the greenhouse warms up. Now, the reason the greenhouse keeps warming up and warming up is because that heat is trapped inside the greenhouse. Um, if, there were, if the windows are open, the heat will, through convection currents, get blown away. And we know that that's what happens when, with greenhouses. It's the same, thing that, same process that causes our cars to get incredibly hot if we park them in a parking lot on a summer day. It's not that the heat is coming through the glass and warming up the car. It's the visible wavelengths, visible ranges of wavelengths passing through the glass, hitting the upholstery inside the car and getting transformed into heat, which radiates back into the body of the car, doesn't pass out through the glass, and so the car gets ever hotter and hotter. So this is how the greenhouse effect works. Let's take this now to the planet and see how it works at a planetary level. So again, we are going to look at this process, but I do want to warn you, um, the atmosphere of this planet, you can see, is incredibly thick. So I'm not drawn this to scale. I've fattened out the atmosphere so I can show you what's happening in the atmosphere. So again, our happy sun, smiling today. Incoming visible light passes through the atmosphere. We know it does because we can see colors around us. That's the consequence of incoming visible radiation. That incoming radiation, short length, largely short wavelength radiation passes through the atmosphere, reaches the surface of the Earth, and just as in the greenhouse, that surface and gets transformed into heat, and that heat starts radiating outwards. Now, we have a number of gases in our atmosphere that have the, uh, the property that they will absorb heat as it's radiating out from the surface of the Earth. And so some of that heat gets in our atmosphere, and the rest of it passes through back out into space. Now, this is the key to the process of global warming. Uh, I should note that the absorbance of heat is in the lower atmosphere, which is where we live. Now, if the density of gases in our atmosphere increases, as the particular gases that, are, that can absorb that outwardly radiating infrared radiation, what's going to happen is more of the outwardly radiating heat is going to be trapped. And as a consequence, less heat escapes into space. And you can see pretty quickly that if we are trapping less, uh, if we're trapping more heat in our atmosphere and less is escaping, the consequence is going to be a warming atmosphere. And that's exactly what is happening. 
The interesting question is um, to ask is what proportion of the heat energy that is retained on our planet is actually absorbed by our atmosphere as opposed to going somewhere else inside our planet. And I'll just let you think about that for a couple of seconds and just, just come up with an answer which seems to make sense. How much of that heat that's retained in our planet is, re is retained by our atmosphere as opposed to going somewhere else inside, inside this sphere? And we'll answer that question pretty much right away. The question is, where is this global warming going? Interesting, when we look at the percentages of that retained heat, we find that only about 2.3% of that retained heat is actually retained in our atmosphere. And as we look through this list, we can see where much of the other percentages of that retained heat are going. 2.1% is heating up continents, and you can see um, ice in various ice caps, Arctic, Greenland, and Arctic, various components of that retained heat are going to these other places. But if you look through that list, you can see we're way, way far away from 100%. So the question is, where's the rest of that heat going? And if you pause for a moment, you might come up with the answer, it's going in the ocean. So it turns out that well over 90% of the heat that's retained on our planet is actually contributing to an increased heat content in the oceans. Now, if you realize for a moment, that if you think for a moment and realize that 70% of the surface of the earth is actually ocean, it starts to make sense that a considerable portion of that heat is going to be retained in the ocean. But in fact, it's more than just the 70%, because a lot of the heat that comes that's reflecting back out from the surface of the Earth is also ending up in our oceans. Our oceans have a tremendous capacity to, to consume the heat that's being retained on the planet. And for that, we are somewhat grateful to our oceans, but it does mean they're warming up. In fact, uh, the amount of energy that is stored in our ocean amounts to about the energy of a Hiroshima bomb once every 30 seconds. And so you can see, I don't exactly know how much energy there is in a Hiroshima bomb, but it sounds like an awful lot, doesn't it? That's how much energy is being absorbed by our oceans every hour of the, of the year. Now, if it weren't for our oceans, absorbing that heat, it would actually be contributing to warming of the atmosphere. And so we're grateful to our oceans because if it weren't for those oceans, rather than being about 60 degrees, um, 57, 60 degrees as we are now, would actually be some 120 degrees Fahrenheit in our atmosphere. And you can imagine that would be already quite threatening um, to all life on the planet. So let's go back to our multiple choice question. And after I've gone through that discussion, I'll give you another minute and ask you, see if you've changed your mind about where that is. Uh, about that process, how is what's causing the global warming? I'll give you a minute to think about that through, and then we'll come back with the answer. Okay, I will say when I. Um, when I've asked and, and asked this, gone through this presentation in, in high schools, very often the students will give me their answer to begin with, and I come back after having gone through the discussion. For many of them, their answers haven't changed. I'll see, if, see how that happens for you. Well, the answer to this question is 
heat radiating from the earth outwards is trapped by atmospheric gases and that's what's driving global warming that we are experiencing. Um, a lot of people think it's incoming heat from the sun, but it's not. It's outwardly radiating heat from the surface of the earth. A lot of folks pick item C and they think of it, think the process is caused by heat produced by human industrial commercial activity, which is getting trapped by gases in the atmosphere. And I think what happens is a lot of people misread that first word in that choice as pollution or something like that. Because that's not what the foil here says. It's heat. It's not heat produced by human activity that is causing warming. It's that natural incoming radiation getting transformed into heat that's radiating out. Okay, well, we don't need to do that one again. So let's ask the question, what are the gases in the atmosphere that are causing this phenomenon? Carbon dioxide is the one that we hear about tremendously commonly, and that's because a function of it, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the amount that we're releasing it makes carbon dioxide the most significant contributor to the problem of global warming. Carbon dioxide, uh, as it happens, can live, continue to exist in our atmosphere for centuries into millennia, maybe thousands of years. One, one of the things that we do in the climate arena is define gases in terms of their ability to um, their global warming potential, or as illustrated here, the carbon dioxide equivalent. And it's called the carbon dioxide equivalent because what we are doing is comparing all the other gases to carbon dioxide, which is defined as having the heat, that heat retaining capacity of one. So that's given the value one. The others are all multiples of that one of carbon dioxide. Hence the term carbon dioxide equivalent. <clears throat> Over here we have methane. Uh, methane uh, lives in the atmosphere for only um, about a decade, and because it's so short lived, the global warming potential or carbon dioxide equivalent for that gas is defined in terms of both the 20 year global warming potential and the 100 year global warming potential. So the 20 year um, potential is 86, meaning it's 86 times worse than carbon dioxide at retaining heat. Or if you're on the side of heat retention, I guess you'd say it's 86 times better. On a 100 year basis, on the other hand, it's only 34 times more powerful than is carbon dioxide. The other important gas in our atmosphere is nitrous oxide, which has a 100 year global warming potential, as you can see, of nearly 300. It has a longevity of this for about a century in the atmosphere before being converted. Now, you shouldn't forget, that's certainly the case, that water vapor does have a profound ability to retain heat. Um, but its longevity, as you can see, is only about 10 days in the atmosphere before it gets converted into something else. One of the things that you will hear oftentimes is the major contributor to global warming is water vapor. Well, it certainly does play a role, but it's more a follower than a cause. In other words, what really is happening is the atmosphere is warming, water is evaporating, and so the water in water bodies is evaporating into the atmosphere, and so the uh, humidity of the atmosphere is actually increasing a little, profoundly, uh, but it has increased a little. But that water vapor in the atmosphere is more a consequence of warming, and 
and then once that water vapor gets into the atmosphere, it becomes a self-accelerating um, process of a positive feedback loop is what happens. So the more water in the atmosphere, the more warming happens, the more evaporation, the more water in the atmosphere. But it only, each molecule only lasts a short period of time until we get into a cooling period and then the water falls out of the atmosphere. The last uh, gas that's a problem is not a naturally occurring one. This is the array of um, chlorofluorocarbon gases and hydrochlorofluorocarbons. They are man or woman made, and they're made, made by us. They're used in industrial processes, largely uh, we know them as being propellants in aerosols and also as being important refrigerants. And that's, those are the main um, uses we have for these things. They're also for, for used in industrial cleaning. The problem with these gases is that they have a longevity of uh, up, up 200, two and a half hundred years but they have global warming potentials of um, many cases way over 5,000 times as much as that of carbon dioxide. So these gases, although fortunately they're not in high concentration, they are profound greenhouse gases. What we're looking at here is the historic trends in the concentration of these gases in our atmosphere. On the left-hand side, you can see carbon dioxide uh, measured in terms of parts per million. So we're looking again at time and the concentration of these gases over time. And you can see that uh, up until very recently, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has pretty much not exceeded about 275, 280 parts per million. But when we get to this very recent era here, we can see that the uh, concentration has suddenly jumped up, and that's, that's the industrial revolution, the question of fossil fuels. Over here, we see methane. Now, this, uh, this gas is in much lower concentration. Fortunately, remember, it's, it's uh, 34, 86 times worse than carbon dioxide at retaining heat. The concentration of methane is measured only in parts per billion. It's much less dense. There's much less methane than there is carbon dioxide. And then over here we have nitrous oxide. Uh, and again, it's measured in parts per billion. Um, fortunately, because it's, again, its global warming potential is nearly 300. But you can see with methane and nitrous oxide, the same basic trend pretty level, pretty flat up until about the Industrial Revolution when we started getting an increase in methane and nitrous oxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So most of the increase in concentration of these three gases, remember these are the three major contributors to global warming, most of that increase in concentration has happened in the last 250 or so years. Now, this brings us to a much more recent period. Again, look at the horizontal axis. This goes back to just before 1985, about 1980. You can see the concentration of carbon dioxide on the left is continuing to rise. Um, remember, I said it, uh, about the Industrial Revolution, it was 275, 280 parts per million. You can see now it's, it's, it's rising, rising, rising. In fact, we are over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide now, largely as a function of combustion of fossil fuels. Over here we see methane, and methane exhibited an interesting uh, behavior. You can see 1985 to about 2000 was rising, and then it leveled off for the first several years of this, this century, and now it started rising again. Over here we see um, nitrous oxide again showing a pretty consistent rise. 
but this one is is particularly important to us that methane has started to increase in its atmospheric concentration. Uh, exactly why that is is not clear, but there's a lot of concern about the consequences of uh, of fracking, particularly fracking of natural gas, fracking of oil, which releases methane into the atmosphere. What we're looking at here is the major greenhouse gases, and you can see carbon dioxide and methane clearly labeled, and then the, the reds and the yellows are labeled here on the left-hand left corner. What we're looking at is the um, what's called the annual greenhouse gas index. This was a, a measure that the National and Aeronautical Association uh, Administration, excuse me, developed to depict what's happening to atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. And what they did was they defined the concentration of these gases in 1990 as one, and then measured the concentration compared to that both before and after it. And what I'm going to do is um, it's just illustrate what's happening. So you can see the non-carbon dioxide gases account for about 0.5 of the total 1.43 measure index of greenhouse gases. So the contribution of the greenhouse gases other than carbon dioxide is 0.5 divided by 1.43. And so um, something like 35 to 40 percent of the warming that we are experiencing is a function of gases other than carbon dioxide. You will hear people constantly talking about carbon or carbon dioxide as the problem. But the point that I want to stress here, and it's a point that I make frequently when I'm talking about this issue, is if we forget the other greenhouse gases, what we are doing is overlooking 35 to 40 percent of the problem. So, in addition to addressing our carbon dioxide emissions, what we also have to do is focus on these other emissions. Okay, so let's pause for a minute now and spend a few minutes looking at some of the most common um, alternative explanations that have been proposed to, to explain the warming that we have seen. And I'm not going to go into these in great detail because these are very quick summaries of, of these explanations. So we're going to look at the fact, the claim we're still coming out of the last us. Age or it's the wobble of the earth. We're going to look at solar radiation, volcanoes, El Nino, and I'll just close with the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration explanation. The Milankovitch cycle was a, is a, a, a combination of three component cycles. This was first uh, articulated at the, towards the beginning of the last century and finally gained um, recognition as being a reasonable explanation about the 1970s. It's a 100,000 year cycle composed of three sub-cycles. The first is called the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. That's a 105,000 year cycle and that's depicted here. And what you can see is that the, uh, the orbit of the Earth is not constant. It goes through this 100,000 year cycle of being kind of long and thin and shorter and fatter. So that's the first component in the Milankovitch array of cycles. Um, I should say I've been uh, corrected in the pronunciation of Milankovitch, that it should be Milankovic. I'm, I'm not Serbian, so I'm, I just passed that on. I may be mispronouncing it. The second uh, component of the Milankovitch Milankovic cycle is a 41,000 year cycle in the tilt of the Earth. I know I spent years teaching ecology thinking that the tilt of the Earth was 23.5 degrees, and that's always 
the way it's been. It turns out that the tilt of the earth, let me see if I can illustrate this, actually goes back and forwards from 21.1 to 24.5. And it does that over a 41,000 year cycle. That's actually what's been termed the wobble of the earth. So that's depicted here. That's the obliquity of the ecliptic for those two such phrases. Okay, the third is a 21,000 year cycle in the um, direction of that tilt. And so rather than just tilting backwards and forwards, that tilt actually rotates. And so that causes a precession of the equinoxes. And so what we think of as the summer and winter equinoxes is sort of June 21st, December 21st, they actually cycle on that 21,000 year basis. This is the precession of the equinoxes depicted earlier. So those three components of the Milankovitch Milankovitch cycle actually have an impact on global temperature. And I'll look at that here. So what you can see is the three, these three other three cycles. Um, the middle one is the obliquity of the ecliptic. The top one is eccentricity, and the bottom one is precession of the equinoxes. Okay, and the, the trend that we see is, um, okay, I, this, there was a label here that seems to be missing, so I'll just go back. As these, as these lines rise, they cause warming, and as they lower, they cause cooling. So those three cycles actually have a temperature impact on the planet. And the, the important thing to notice is that when we go through... Um, the last two ice ages, the Illinois and Wisconsin ice ages, what you can see is the combination of the Milankovic patterns have led to cooling during those periods. And what I particularly want to draw to your attention is this item here. That's where we are today. What you can see is that the combination of these three cycles should be causing planetary cooling. In fact, all three of those are causing a decline in temperature. And so what the Milankovic pattern tells us is, if that is what is controlling Earth's temperature today, we should be on a cooling trend. It's not the one of the Earth because the model of the Earth would be causing cooling. A second argument that we often hear is it's all a function of solar activity. And to address that one, what we're going to do here is look at the solar irradiance on the vertical axis here, the degrees in temperature on the vertical axis here. The red line is temperature and the yellow line is solar radiation. And what you can see here is, since about the, what, 1950, overall solar radiation has been on a decline in exactly the same time that global temperature has been rising. What these data do very clearly is falsify the hypothesis that, that global warming is a function of solar activity. In fact, solar activity, again, just like the Milankovitch cycle, should be causing cooling. Another explanation folks come up with frequently is it's volcanoes, because volcanoes, indeed, when volcanoes erupt, they do indeed release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. What we're looking at here is a series of major volcanic episodes and the overall trend in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, which is where one of the 
this is the cross-section concentration is measured. And what you can see is that the impact of volcanic activity makes not a dent in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Indeed, what does happen is volcanoes emit, when they erupt, they emit a vast amount of ash and other aerosols. So what we're looking at here is the concentration of aerosols uh, in the atmosphere as a function of these various volcanic activities. And what you can see is the volcanic activity increases the concentration of aerosols in the atmosphere. Now, you might say, why is that important? Well, that's important because aerosols in the upper atmosphere have the effect of reflecting incoming radiation back out into space. And so what happens is when volcanoes erupt, they put a lot of aerosol into the atmosphere, actually almost negligible amount of carbon dioxide compared to that which results from human activity. And the outcome of that is that every time we have a major volcanic eruption, we actually go through a global cooling period for about a year or two. So volcanoes don't cause warming, they cause cooling. Another pattern which is often um, raised as a potential explanation for um, global warming is, is a series, there are a series of uh, major climatic oscillations, particularly impacting temperatures. One of these is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and to that will be mentioned uh, besides the names of the Pacific Decade Oscillation and the multi decade Atlantic uh, Oscillation. So let's just look at um, the El Nino Oscillation, and what you can see here is the pattern of El Nino and La Nina events. El Ninos are going upwards and La Ninas are going downwards. And we can certainly see that these have uh, an impact on uh, local conditions. But the impact of El Nino is very local in, in terms of temperature in uh, the area off the Pacific coast of um, North, Northern South America and across to Indonesia. Although it does have a, a regional impact, um, its global impact is very small. You can see these are the um, major El Nino years and these are the major La Nina years. But what happens is um, where we live, um, El Nino tends to make winters warmer and drier than average with below normal snowpack and stream flow. In California, they tend to be wetter and can cause what sometimes referred to as Godzilla floods. On the other hand, La Nina winters tend to be cooler and wetter than average with above normal snowpack and stream flow. But that's just the impact on the Western United States. The global impact is a very small impact on temperature. The key item to look at here is that these El Nino and La Nina sequences actually backwards and forwards, and there's nothing there that could be described as causing this trend in global warming. So the last one that seems to be relevant is the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And what this chart is showing us is the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over a period from 1700 up until um, now, has shown a tremendous increase in concentration. And what we're doing over here is measuring these greenhouse gases in terms of their carbon dioxide equivalent. And this, this is again using that annual greenhouse gas index that I introduced from a little bit earlier. So those gases are showing a pattern which is quite consistent with the warming of the planet that we have seen, particularly during the last, uh, last century and during the period from 1950 to 1970, 1980. 
that's not consistent. So given those three competing hypotheses, the one that is born, that bears further analysis is the greenhouse gas hypothesis. Alenkovic has been falsified, solar radiation has been falsified, uh, volcano is clearly not relevant, and the, uh, the various oscillations just don't have a large enough global impact to be um, relevant. That brings me to this, um, this kind of summary of the issue, which I'll just deal with very quickly. <laughs> what, what we very often hear is that, that, that critics of climate science, they say, oh, you people, you called it global warming, and then that didn't work, so you changed the name to climate change. And the response to that is wrong. The terms global warming and climate change have been in use consistently. And this simply illustrates the distinction between them. The primary cause for the events that we're seeing are increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That leads to the primary effect, which is global warming. And that global warming leads to a secondary effect, which is climate change. And that's all the array of um, patterns that we see in uh, snowpack reduction, uh, precipitation patterns, and so forth. So climate change and global warming are different. The primary consequence of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration increases is global warming. The secondary is the change in climate that we see around us. And the other component that is often confusingly mixed in with all of this is what happens when carbon dioxide enters our oceans. This leads to ocean acidification. Very often people lump ocean acidification with global warming. In my judgment, they shouldn't be. They are both consequences of increasing atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration because that causes these two different phenomena, global warming on the one hand and ocean acidification on the other. That's simply, that, that strain is simply there to help discriminate between these various components, which are often linked together in a rather confusing mesh manner. Okay, so it's time for another question. I want to quickly talk about what's causing the problem, and, it's, uh, and that's illustrated here. Uh, coal, oil, gasoline, and gas are the main contributors to the problem, releasing carbon dioxide, methane, and other processes that we engage in, land use conversions, com conversions and agriculture and forestry, which result in greenhouse gas emissions. I will jump through a lot of these because there's a point that I want to get to, which deals with the models. And we'll jump through all of this. Um, one of the things that people often complain about is whether the models are um, credible. And not surprisingly, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change has explored this issue. And what they have done is provided data on uh, 36 general circulation models, which include human influences. And this is a, um, a graph illustrating that. We have the years on this axis and the change in temperature on this. And the, the um, blue, black, and red lines here represent actual data. And the orange represents what the models suggest if we include human influences. And you can see that the, the models follow very closely what the actual data reveal. What this chart shows us is that if we don't include human activity, human emissions of greenhouse gases, and we only look at the natural influences, what this is showing is the temperature should be following this pattern. It's actually following this one. The models 
In other words, the models are very consistent with what's actually been happening. Indeed, we'll jump through that one. What we're doing when we look, in, look into the future is um, set up, what the climate scientists do is set up a series of what are called scenarios which depict a future under different greenhouse gas uh, concentration scenarios. And over here we can see the representative concentration pathways are 2.6, which means we pretty much control the emissions right away. 8.5, which uh, describes a very rapid increase in emissions, a business as usual scenario, and two intermediate patterns, uh, scenarios. So the red line is the 8.5 scenario. Uh, which has been called business as usual because that's the trajectory we're on. It was actually defined as the worst case scenario. In fact, when we look at the patterns, what we find is that the um, land and ocean temperature index from NASA is pretty much right on what the 8.5 representative concentration pathway illustrates. And that's illustrated in both of these graphs. Another point that people often say is those, those models exaggerate what's likely to happen. And this illustrates um, exactly a, a, the, the response to that criticism. What we can see here on the red line is what's been happening to Arctic sea ice extent and what the models have projected. The point is that what's actually happening is way more severe than what the models have suggested. This chart depicts um, what's happening with ocean level rise in relation to the uh, various model projections. And what we see is the, ocean, the actual rise in the ocean is way at the most severe end of what the projections suggest. 